We are now going to have a uh, global dialogue and understanding. Uh, so I'd ask you to join me in welcoming our panelists. First, uh, Dirk Messner uh, of the German Development Institute and Dennis Snower of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. If both of you would like to uh, join me here on the stage on either side. Uh, they are joined by Carlos Lopez, who's from the University of Cape Town. Rohinton Mahudra, who's the, from the Center for International Governance Innovation. And Shang Huan, who's from the Institute of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And they are rejoined by our two earlier contributors, Lars Henrik Ruller and Beatrice Nafal. A round of applause for all of them, please. <laughs> and uh, just to say, uh, Ambassador Nafal has to uh, leave us before the end of the discussion because she has to catch a flight. I'll tell you from my experience that if it's a British Airways flight, <laughs> you may not have to hurry that urgently. <laughs> uh, and your, uh, your luggage will reach you eventually uh, in this uh, greatly globalized world. Uh, Dennis uh, Snower, good evening, good afternoon uh, to you as the president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. What are your initial thoughts? I am struck by one theme that seems to be emerging again and again through the course of all these different discussions concerning the different points on the German agenda, which is that the process of economic progress may somehow come adrift from social prosperity and the need to focus economies, focus politics on human needs is crying out to us. <coughs> and if the citizens of the G20 were aware that their leaders are focused on human needs, I think they would be very reassured. Beatrice Nafal, that uh, chimes with some of the remarks that you were making earlier, this need to refocus the agenda on human need. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the, this need to, to change priorities. Uh, if you just uh, take the Sorry. microphone there, please. Sorry. This need to change priorities was present <laughs> throughout the conference, the G20 conference, both in the first session. Gabriela Ramos talked about the OECD Sherpa, about the need to re-change the the growth model in the last session, thinking about the new paradigm also of the growth model, Richard Summons just mentioned. Well, the seeds of that were planted with the German presidency, I have to say. Uh, there are some elements there planted that are very important to, to give continuity to this agenda. I, I focusing on people's needs or, or people-centered growth also brings the issue of social justice, uh, which is a key issue on the table. Thank you. Uh, Carlos Lopez, uh, once upon a time you were the Executive Secretary at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Those points about the need to reshape the agenda, to focus more on human needs, uh, a more human focus. Do you agree with those? Do they resonate with you? Well, uh, resonating doesn't mean necessarily this is a legitimate process for the G20 to be the protagonist. Because you see, uh, I, I see four paradoxes that are emerging from the G20 process. The first paradox is that we are talking about inclusiveness by an exclusive group. And therefore, you know, we have all this lingo about how we should be more inclusive, how we should be more participatory. But in fact, you know, it's an exclusive group that is excluding for the matter a very important constituency for that type of debate, which are the Africans, because you only have South Africa as a member of the group. Even with these characteristics that uh, in terms of GDP composition, depending on how you calculate it, you know, Egypt and Nigeria probably would qualify to be in the group as well, because there is an underestimation of GDP in Africa overall. The second paradox is that we have a crisis of legitimacy that derives from representativeness. We say that the Security Council is not representative, so we replace it by a mechanism, the G20, that is also not representative. And uh, we have to figure why is it that some of these agenda items are populating the T20 process, the G20 process, when in fact you know, they have been the subject of other initiatives and other processes that are more uh, representative. 
The third paradox is that you have uh, an expansion of the G20 agenda at a time where there is a crisis in the agenda that is already in existence. Um, you have uh, obviously the beginnings of the G20 that were associated with the financial crisis, and now it's expanding way beyond the financial at a time where they can't fix the financial. So this is, uh, for me, uh, a very interesting development. And finally, I would say that you have also uh, a decoupling uh, of the debate from uh, social gains uh, versus economic growth. We just heard Richard mentioning it and say this decoupling is actually not witnessed the same way in different parts of the geography. Obviously, for industrialized economies and very well-established mature economies, there is a decoupling. There is a decoupling because uh, a technological progress is not producing gains in productivity. You have, uh, you know, basically stagnating uh, social gains and even stagnating growth sometimes. But when there is growth, there is no uh, social gains because the crisis of the model is the crisis of uh, demography that we'll probably cover. But it's not the same story in Africa. It's not the same story in parts of Asia, for sure. And I think you know, there is this element that is missing in the debate. So for me, these four paradoxes are important from the vantage point where I sit. Uh, it's, it's, it's a debate that is still about Africa, not with Africa. Thank you. Uh, Zhang Yuan from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I uh, strongly, you know, uh, support your idea uh, that, that that is uh, uh, the meeting the human needs uh, should you know reshape the agenda of G20. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we we should also you know remember that uh, different people has different uh, you know concerns. It's very uh, you know there is a, a gap between the advanced economies and. Uh, uh, and uh, developing the emerging economies when they think about uh, the needs, the human needs, you know, because of, you know, there is a, a different uh, level of development among different countries. So personally, I, I agree with you, but uh, in particular, we need to, we, 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 we cannot neglect the differences when we define the human need. Thank you. Dennis, did you want to reply to that before I bring Aunt Rohinton into the discussion? I think we should all be very clear that poor countries need economic development and uh, material needs which economics f furnishes will be absolutely central to developing their social prosperity as well. As we become more advanced, it's possible that the two decouple. And the fact that there is a lot of discontent uh, in many countries, particularly the advanced ones, um, but some developing ones as well, shows that it is important simply to focus on human needs. Now, I agree with you that we haven't uh, solved the financial problems, but that should not absolve us from ignoring human needs, uh, even when these human needs cannot be accounted for by GDP alone. Carlos Lopez? Well, uh, you see, we, we never discuss the real issues because they are a bit uh, disruptive. Like, for instance, demography. If we were looking into the demographic tectonic shifts the way we should, we'd actually be welcoming migration. Everybody agrees with that. Uh, if you have an aging population in the most uh, mature economies and about one quarter of the population is already 65 or older and they are going to be three quarters by 2065, it's obvious that they need either to produce babies or some would say produce robots, but also, you know, they have to accept some migrants. And I think because this discussion is not taking place, we uh, con decontextualize the migration, let's say, from Africa, because I'm talking from an African perspective. We have about two million Africans that migrate outside the continent uh, per year. Uh, it's a population of about 1.2 uh, billion. Uh, in fact, this is about one-fifth of the number of migrants that go out of China. So we actually uh, are associating poverty with that migration when, in fact, we are talking about human mobility dimensions that we refuse to discuss. 
So that is the real human dimension that I would like to discuss. But Thank you. I, I want a quick thought from Zhang Yuan yeah. using that microphone. Yeah, okay. And okay. then we will move the panel on. Yeah, no. uh, Dr. Snor uh, mentioned uh, the GDP. We cannot you know, uh, make the GDP growth as a single, single you know, objective. I, I totally agree with you. You know, uh, uh, GDP is a uh, uh, commonly used uh, you know, a measurement uh, when we uh, calculate the amount of uh, uh, output. Uh, uh, but uh, but there, there is some problem with that, that uh, uh, index. At least there are two important missing elements. You know, one is, uh, you know, uh, it, it is, I think it's a short. Uh, to you know, measure the improvement in quality of our products and uh, uh, services. Uh, let, let me give you an example, you know, cell phone. Uh, when we compare the, the, the prices of cell phones uh, made uh, in different decades, we, we, we can find you know, the prices are almost the same, but the quality of the, 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 the cell phone is totally different. It, the smartphone, today's smartphone, it's, it's far more beyond a simple you know, a tool of uh, communication uh, among, among you know, people. Uh, uh, and another missing, uh, missing element is that you know, the GDP index uh, neglect, neglect the, the, the measurement of uh, you know, a deterioration of uh, uh, environment and the de depletion of natural resources. So what is encouraging is that uh, a number of, uh, you know, a group of uh, economists and uh, scientists working at uh, research institutions affiliated with the United Nations University and uh, uh, UNESCO, they have tried to, you know, uh, they have tried to, to, to measure, to, to, to calculate the above mentioned uh, missing, you know, missing elements by creating a new, new uh, index that is uh, inclusive wealth index. This index is composed of the three, three parts, produced capital, uh, uh, natural capital, and the human capital. Of course, uh, so far, the, the, this index is not perfect, but I, and I don't think the, uh, it will re replace, replace yes. the GDP. Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and it's something that I'm sure the others will have okay. something to say about uh, as well. We're hinting, Maduro, you've been very patient. We haven't heard from you in this discussion uh, at all yet. There was a, uh, a, a general uh, discussion about the, the relevance and the competency of the G20 in many of these issues. And I'm sure I saw you uh, on YouTube only today talking about the, the relevance of the G20. Right, so watch the video. Uh, <laughs> wait for my piece on Project Syndicate <laughs> next week. But so two thoughts occur to me at this point, listening to this and, and to your point. One is that the G20, by the way, which is 19 countries, not 20, uh, as you would re recall, uh, Nigeria was supposed to be in that 20, and at the last minute was, uh, did not make it because of it. So I, I endorsed a point about Nigeria and Egypt. So let's say it's a G21, and it is more inclusive. The question still is that the G20 began as an economic forum. Uh, and as Jeff Sachs and others would, would tell us correctly, economics is a social science, and we've sometimes forgotten the social in the science. So the fact that the G20 agenda is broadening, uh, even though it's an economics forum, is not a bad thing. The second thought then is again <laughs> going back to those early discussions around the G20, how wide can its ambit be before it becomes everything to everyone and therefore achieves nothing? And I'd say that for some time, the G20 has been in drift. And I think uh, there has been a very diligent process under the German presidency to corral it and make it more effective. We talked about that late last year. And so I read into the current agenda, and if it continues so much the better, uh, I read into it this business of getting more of the social into the social science. What do I mean by that? Um, 
the focus on Africa, initially, unfortunately named the Marshall Plan for Africa, but since uh, appropriately framed, is a good example of that, that you see Africa both as an opportunity, but also as a way to prevent risk uh, later on, investing in future growth and in future development. I'd say the climate change agenda spills into economics in important ways, and even now there's resistance among some Sherpas about drift. Uh, I don't think it's drift to talk about things like climate change and innovation policy and new technology. So I think we have to get that bounce right. We're on the right track, but only time will tell. Climate change is on your agenda? Yes. Yes, says uh, Argentina. Thank you very much. Uh, Dirk Messner, uh, the director of the German Development Institute. Uh -huh. Welcome to our discussion, your perspectives. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, I would like to emphasize that Ri Richard and Beatrice, you mentioned the issue of societies under stress, and this goes beyond actually Gini indices or something like that. You talked about acceleration of modernization, you talked about acceleration of technological change. Akalov yesterday talked about the issue of identity of people, their place in the world, um, reco social recognition of people. No? And the lessons learned, I think, from our discussion is that if we don't get these kind of things right, this translates into right-wing populism, our country first, so it's related to the global governance issue. If we don't get the equity issue right, if we don't get this social societies under stress challenges right, we will not make any progress when it comes to global governance. And the second issue which I wanted to, to emphasize, this comes back to the United States. No? wanted to talk about the United States, so I will talk about the United Thank States. Thank you for naming them. Yeah, <laughs> very briefly, because I think when we, we reflect about global governance, we need to think how, how, to, how to substitute things which uh, the United States now might not deliver. So contributions to the, United, to the United Nations, contributions to global aid, contributions to reducing emissions, contributions to the global, uh, to the Green Investment Fund. No? So we have the, the president of the Green Investment Fund here. So one of the challenges now is how are we going to challenge, uh, how are we going to manage these challenges which are going to be produced uh, by the administration of the president, uh, Donald Trump. Thank you. Lars Henrik Roller, what do you make of the what you've heard so far. Oh, sorry, uh, can yes, I add Beatrice. One yes. Challenge uh, with, the with the microphone. Sorry, can I add one challenge to that? Changes in financial regulation that may bring us back to the situation in 2007. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree a lot also with this, this focus on, on social issues and inclusiveness, which is what we've done. Um, I understand the point, your, your four paradox about, you know, the first one about, you know, the G20 being, you know, exclusive. Uh, we're actually 35. Um, we have a compact with Africa, not for Africa, which we're going to organize on the 12th and 13th. I think um, you know some of you are very much involved in that. So it's not perfect, and you can certainly criticize it. But we, you know, the glass is half full. We try to be more inclusive, and we need to be even more inclusive and as exclusive as we can, and still be practical. Um, so I, I think it's actually, okay, it's the biggest economies in the world, maybe we should add one or two more, or maybe more countries. Uh, there are costs to doing that, but the fact that, and it's not also academics who meet and discuss win-win situations uh, in their models, and I'm an academic myself, it's the politicians who have their agendas, some of them we don't agree with. In fact, we don't necessarily agree with each other's agendas, and you may agree with some of them or not agree with some of them, and I won't, you know, but it's essentially them knocking their heads. And, you know, if we can sort of focus the agenda on people's needs, actually, I think we've always think about people's needs. I don't understand this discussion very well. Uh, I think it's hard choices, and it's special interest groups, uh, you know, in Germany, you don't get elected if you don't think about people's needs. It's very much a, gra you know, it's, an, it's uh, you know, members of parliaments have their the parliamentary districts. They talk to them every weekend. So, so I think it's it's not that they're too. Let me be blunt, too stupid, and need to tell them let's focus more on people's needs. We smart academics know it better. I'm being very provocative, you know, I know I'm in a minority, but I used to be, you know, 20 years in academics, now I'm in, uh, I'm talking to these politicians. 
uh, but it's hard choices. So if you put pressure on them, and maybe that's what you're doing by saying you should focus on people's needs more. I'm yes. not saying that. Huh? That's what I, it sounds no, a little no, bit like no, that. No, that's not what then, I said. But well, let well me just, let me just, I just try to be provocative because it bothers me a little bit sometimes because I used to be an academic and now I'm in the policy side. They, they have their agendas, their politic, they got elected on political agendas and it's, you know, and it's tough choices they need to take. And I think our role as Sherpas and our role as organizing these things is focusing on the topics. And I'm happy um, we're doing something right here that I think moving these topics into these areas as what we're doing is, I think, important. We're not neglecting financial market regulation. We want to do Basel III, the final regulatory issue. But there are big differences in opinions on that. There are countries and there are people in every country who want to do more and want to do more or less on financial markets. It's not like we haven't done it. We can't agree on anything else. Okay, thank you. What were you saying? Well, uh, basically, I, I, what I said is that the real human dimensions are not at the table. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are fluffed around. It, we, we, f like, for instance, the way we discuss migration. That was my point. But, you know, I if, we, if you want to go further, you know, I, I'm not the one who is going to be against uh, a compact or some uh, special attention to Africa. I, I welcome that. But you know, the argument is constructed around efficiency. Your argument is the efficiency argument. Is the no, green, it's I the said green it's room. also Act investing to avoid future problems. Yes, but you said, you said this is an exclusive group because otherwise you know, we go wild right. too many. Right. That's the efficiency argument. And that efficiency argument is the green room argument, is the security council composition argument. It's an argument that you know, has its merits, but it excludes Africa. Okay, thank you, Petrus. Yes. I think basically the global economic governance is at a crossroad, and that's because of a number of factors. It's, it's rapid, uh, exponential, disruptive technological change. It's a low growth trap. It's basically reform fatigue, regulatory uncertainty as 2016 onwards. Therefore, the G20 has a critical role to play to uphold the international rules-based system to uphold international cooperation, to uphold multilateralism. And for emerging countries, whenever you have the presidency, it's a key opportunity because it's the only time in the world where you can set the priorities and where developed and developing countries discuss at the same level. In every other forum, we have integrated under the rules the advanced countries design. That's the case of the ExGAT and the WTO. That's the case of all the bread and goods institutions. So this is a process. It's a very important political process. It's not a legal process, but it's a very important political process. Thank you, Dennis Neuer. I think uh, when discussing um, human needs, the question is, uh, what are they? Are they summarized completely through the goods and services that we produce? And if so, then economics is sufficient. And uh, is it goods and services plus their distribution? We often talk as if that were sufficient. And my claim is that that's not the case. In your argument, when you say, Look at the demography in the Western countries. They're aging. They should welcome the migrants. That overlooks an important human need in the host countries, which is to maintain their social rootedness, to maintain their communities, which they feel have become adrift through technological change, globalization, and certainly uh, also threatened by migration. These are things that we need to bring to the table. People feel disempowered. They feel they don't have an opportunity for social solidarity. These things cannot be measured easily through economic standard economic measures. Thank you. Third but question. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to mention what we discussed during the last two days, which is the time dimension. I understand how all these difficulties in organizing consensus in the G20, you know, but what we discussed is that there are three big multipliers of inequalities and stress on societies, and those are climate change, digitalization, next wave of infrastructures, and all these are kind of things are happening during the next 15 to 20 years. So I, want I would like to, to stress this, so we can push things into the right direction, but we can move into completely 
um, meaningless direction and multiplying the I inequality issues which we are mentioning here. So time is critical. Thank you. Shang Juran, using the microphone, please. I, I, I'd, I'd like to, to see so my, my comments on, on the, the human needs. You know, human needs, human, human beings uh, high have, uh, you know, different you know, dimensions of needs. So the problem is uh, the, the ordering, the priorities, which is the most important, which is uh, you know requires uh, to be uh, to, to 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 be met first. So so priorities and the sequences matters a lot. And uh, uh, you 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 know you know uh, we we have to admit we we can we cannot you know meet all all human human needs uh, simultaneously. So. The priorities we we have to identify priorities. That is my comments on on, on that. Thank you, Rich. So mm. two thoughts on because I I take Carlos's point that there's a balance between efficiency and voice, and we can't always be slave to efficiency. Mm. My sense is, you know, if if all it were were voice, we wouldn't have needed the G20, and the UN would work just fine. And we know that story. So I think there's a couple of quick fixes that the group might consider. Uh, I'd certainly say move to the G21. Uh, the other uh, suggestion that has been made is that G20 decisions be ratified in the General Assembly. So it's not as if we can't get it right, but remember, this group came together in crisis and things had to be done. My second point on, uh, on exclusiveness is I think the G20 could do itself a real favor if it set itself a goal and achieved it. That would stop a lot of the naysayers very quickly. And the fact is, even on some of the financial sector reforms, and you alluded to them, uh, we have made progress that's, to put it politely, painful and slow. Uh, if the G20 used its efficiency to be efficient, then the voice argument would take care of itself. Politically, does that work? I'm not sure exactly. I mean, actually, we set ourselves goals in the G20, even quantitative goals. Um, you know, not in, in your financial market regulation, I think is a slightly different one, but in labor market, in women uh, participation, uh, and others. Uh, so we set quantitative goals. It's always a difficult one because you know, a lot of leaders don't want to submit themselves in this sort of soft G20 context to hard uh, quantitative goals. Um, you know, we try this very hard because, you know, sometimes we want to show that we've actually achieved something also quantitative in the G20. And then one can look at the accountability. I said that earlier. I think the accountability is also important. Uh, there are some, also academic institutions, Toronto, I think, is one of them, which is actually looking at have they, sorry, have they followed through, um, you know, with what they promised at the summits? Uh, I think that's useful. Um, and, um, you know, so I think that's, uh, and I think, again, I think the G20 has been, um, you know, somewhat successful. I think we've, we've had a lot of discussions on financial market, on tax reform, you know, automatic exchange of information, BEPS, it's all not perfect, and we still haven't implemented it full, <coughs> uh, but that has a lot of backing, so it's political support to processes which run anyways giving you political backing. You know, a lot of people in this room, policy makers and others. And I think from that point of view, G20 has delivered. At taking it beyond and making it sort of more, you know, I think what you said is have the UN pass the G20 endorse. or endorse it. Uh, uh, I think it's actually pretty good with the way it's working right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe one can think about expanding the countries, but this is not my decision, but I'll, I'll take that away. <laughs> is, your, is your concern that one of subsidiarity, that actually, uh, instead of creating a whole new international element to the G20's work, a more appropriate development is for it to devolve down some of those responsibilities yeah. to uh, you know, national, even local or regional. Yeah, I, I, you know, my, my job is right now to get a successful summit for Germany. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. But I think it's an interesting discussion is how can you develop it in terms of global governance further? Yeah. My initial reaction is, and we've had some of those discussions with the context of civil dialogue. Yeah. Should we, you know, do this differently than the way we're doing this? Uh, and I've sort of said, uh, not this year, because we are doing it the way we're doing it, and 
I think it has worked and we try to optimize within the model we have how we do this dialogue. But my, my initial feeling would be the G20 is what the G20 is, you know? And I think um, being too ambitious, uh, one has to be careful that one doesn't over freight it. Um, my view would be let's try to get good summits. You know, let's help Argentina next year to move the world in these policy areas. Because the real constraint is not Okay, this is, is maybe a short run answer. It's not necessarily so much the governance, that's an issue one likes to talk about, but it's actually getting agreement amongst the leaders on important policy issues. So having everybody endorse yep. the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure this is a G20 governance issue. Uh, it's much more than that and uh, you know, I think that's that's where what 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 is important. Okay, thank you, Dirk Messner. Yeah, two things. One, the UN uh, G20 link. I would say that we do have two fantastic United Nations regimes: the Paris Agreement 2030 Agenda. So, link UN and G20 towards um, delivering on that. This is how endorsement should mm. take place. My second point is that. Global governance has been developing further in the G20 context, and I would uh, mention the outreach formats which we have been, uh, which have been evolving during the last years to come. I mean, in times of trouble of intergovernmentalism and inter and multilateralism, these kind of networks between our societies, as such, are helpful. Not only are we producing ideas and solutions and technical advice, uh, the interaction itself between our societies, academics, uh, civil societies are creating the preconditions for better global governance uh, midterm, I would argue. Yeah, uh, on that, I think this is briefly. important. I think, what is the value added of this? Yeah. It's probably a question you've discussed. I think there, one way is to have impact on the summit. Mm -hmm. You do. And I think we organized that well this year, and I want to go into details. This is something you will do next year, I know as well. The second one is to discuss amongst yourselves mm -hmm. and that is a value in itself. And I think the third one is to have a more, you know, public uh, gesture and to, you know, inform the public and to, but this would be more sort of an outreach in terms of the general media and all these kinds of things. I think those are all three are useful and probably you do all three of those things. Um, but, but I think that's a good question. <laughs> okay, thank you, organize. Jack. Yeah. The, the, the G20 is the most important uh, platform, not an not, uh, international organization. The platform for the global governance in today's world. And the global governance aims to address global issues or global you know, uh, challenges where we are facing today. So the key word is global. Mm. The global here m m means, you know, uh, the global issues are, are those uh, that are you know, closely linked to the uh, welfare of the whole world rather than uh, some specific countries or regions. So this is my, my understanding of the, the global governance. Uh, my second point is that you know, uh, we, we need to, uh, to think about the, the division of labor among different uh, uh, international organizations. Uh, G20, the G20 uh, has its own function, but at the same time, uh, other international organizations like uh, United Nations, uh, uh, IMF, World Bank, and so on and so forth, they have their own functions. So how can we you know, uh, improve the, 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 the division of labor among these, these uh, entities. Uh, entities? It's very important. And uh, by, by, by the way, oh. Dirk oh, yeah, just a okay. quick thought yeah. on that. Yeah. You, you have a microphone already, it's yeah. No, I think that is very important. I mean, what we are, dis what we are discussing here is that we, have to we need to make progress on two fronts. And on the one front is the societies under stress front. You mentioned this uh, very strongly. The second front is the global commons front. Mm -hmm. no? And those are intimately interlinked. And I think this is what we need to transport and to communicate to our societies. Because this is what you have been talking about. Yes. No? Solving social challenges and equity issues with a humanities perspective. No? And thank you. This is what with a world perspective. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rohinder Maduro. Yeah, you, you know, we've been 
talking about of people and social, and you correctly pointed out that there's 19 countries and national interest and strategy. Uh, and that's, that's important. So after the weekend, I think it was Richard Haas who had a tweet along the lines of those of us who've been asking the US to help create international institutions did not have in mind it's helping to create a G6. And so the point is that within the G19, there are coalitions and there are some countries that matter more than others. Okay. And I think the G2 relationship within the G20 will matter a lot. And I think as go US-China relations would go a lot of global governance. Uh, j just a very quick point. Uh, you know, in by 2034, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world. Africa has the largest renewable energy potential in the world. Africa is likely to produce the largest migration because of the demographic developments that are going to take place. Africa is the continent with the largest potential for leapfrogging. It has to have a seat at the table. And that seat of the table is what is going to basically uh, allow for addressing the issues that you have raised very very important issues like you know the the migration disruptions caused by uh, uh, you know uh, identity and other debates and so on but it has to be discussed with the africans at the table not with the africans on the side and then we have a compact with them with all uh, due respect which i welcome the opportunity and the move but it's not enough thank you very much just to say that there is still 10 minutes left on this discussion that clock on the screen is the clock, I think, for your flight rather than exactly. uh, anything else. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, I know that you need to go uh, almost immediately. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador, if we could have a, some thoughts from you okay. uh, on where you think this discussion has brought us, and then we will uh, release you uh, to the, uh, the vagaries of the airports. Definitely, I think we all agree that the direction we have to move is inclusive growth, and inclusive growth also means including different regions like Africa, uh, including people. Uh, uh, and, um, and in this regard, what I think that probably what the world is needing is em emphasizing more the development of an action plan. And that needs, uh, today was said by somewhere from the World Bank, no? We need, for that, we need data, we need policy, or po evidence-based policy, and we need finance. Uh, and um, in, in this regard, I, I think, for instance, the German presidency put in climate change, no, a climate and energy action plan forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can develop something regarding invest, well, there's going to be a concrete initiative regarding women entrepreneurship on the table, which is a very important. It's also an action-based measure this year. Well, on the same line, I'm being completely aware that if there are changes in U.S. policy that impacts the world economy, both either in financial, trade, investment, or climate, we will have to navigate no, or lead the G20 dialogue process in that situation that will impact exactly the Argentine presidency. Understanding that, we think we have to focus on concrete actions that can uh, provide uh, bridges, common ground, so as to keep the process moving forward, because the process has a tremendous political importance. Uh, <coughs> and Africa is at the table, not only South Africa at the table, we have two South African uh, regional organizations at the table, among three that are invited, are two from Africa, no, they're not South African, they're from Africa. There is, I think, one other invited guest from Africa. Argentina is going to continue with, with the compact with Africa. We will broaden the scope because there are other countries in Latin America that have faced the same challenges and the same problems. So Africa is at the table. And uh, uh, regarding data, one, one issue that I want, for me it's amazing how in the United States there is so much literature uh, on, on job market polarization and how, however, in the politicians' discourse, polarization is attributed to globalization and not to technological change. And I think what we need really, particularly at the global level, is to develop better indicators. So data and that, for that, the G20, we have all the multilateral institutions that deal with the statistics. We have the OECD, the IMF, the UN, 
I think we need to develop new indicators first to assess where the automation risk is. For that, we need very disaggregated data at the occupational level, at the task really level to know what routine tasks are in each occupation. And this, we need to develop a global labor survey with this kind of disaggregation. And also, we need to understand whether the new opportunities are. I hear private public sector collaboration are key because you have Microsoft that is knocking the door saying what I can do. Well, we, you can provide for information from LinkedIn to know where new employment opportunities are coming from. And there, the G20 has a tremendous political importance because we can move the multilateral organizations in order to help governments address these major challenges and build uh, uh, inclusive societies and open societies. It's more important open societies than open economies. Beatrice Nafal, thank you so much for being with us today. We are very grateful to you for your contributions. Uh, I did uh, also say that we wanted to have uh, an input and contribution from uh, those of you who've been enjoying uh, and listening uh, to this debate. So if you uh, have a, an observation you want to make, a yeah. question okay. that you want to ask, then now is the time to uh, raise your hand. We have several hands uh, over here. We have two over here as well. Let's start with the closest. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ken. I'm from South Africa. Um, I'm here as a young global changer. Um, I heard the, the topic of inclusion being mentioned by almost all of you in this panel discussion, um, but I want to know how, how the youth can get more involved. Uh, why, why are youth members perhaps not at this table today, in, uh, no, taking part in this panel discussion? I'm young. Um, what are you talking about? Well, <laughs> who, would, uh, <laughs> who would like to take this point? Um, a greater yeah. voice for, for youth. Dennis Snow, you've talked often about the intergenerational conversation that needs to take place. We have a Y20 also, a Youth 20, uh, which uh, is also organizing themselves. And there'll be a summit, uh, I think soon, uh, where the chancellor will also go to and will debate with young people. Um, so, you know, like the T20, I think the T20 is a little uh, larger, but there's a Youth 20 uh, where we discuss that with young people. So I think it's important. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, observation, please. Go ahead. Uh, what is this box? Hmm? The is box is a microphone. It's a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Austin, and I am a young global changer and an American. Um, and so I've heard the reference a lot to my country's role in this process throughout the week, both in very direct messages and implied ones. Um, and like many people in this room, I find it daunting that one political agent can upend international cooperation. So how do you think the G20 process can best correct imbalances when maybe the lead figureheads at the table might not be able to reach agreements? And do you think a more inclusive process could help kind of correct that balance? And <laughs> thank you. You'll get your opportunity to speak in 15 minutes. Uh, how do you inoculate the G20 from Trump? No, I think um, the, ex the example of the G7 was very interesting now. No, six countries opting for climate change and making this visible and making the division visible. And I'm expecting something like that, a debate on climate change and other is issues. At the end of the day, it will be important how many countries are coming together to implement international regimes, which we have all uh, decided upon in 2015. No, so making this visible is for me the most important thing. This has to do with accountability also. Thank you very much. Question from yeah. here. I'm Andrew from Iria, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Actually, when we met last time in December, and now there is a lot of changes. The policies are changing, and the governance are changing, and the G20 leaders are changing. So we should make an appeal, particularly to have some continuity. There are three areas that need. One is the free trade. Second thing is the global connectivity. And third one is the inclusive and sustainable growth. I think uh, you should emphasize to the G20 for the next presidency. This is my appeal. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a hand further along who had uh, their hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, Julia Leininger from the German Development Institute. Actually, we are all here because we believe in evidence-based policies. At the same time, policies are made with the values of people. That, that's, that's what we observe in the US, for instance. So my question is, how can we, as researchers, politicians, link 
the evidence with the values to reach out to these people. Thank you. And if you pass it to the uh, hand in front of you, we'll take that question as well before we go back to the panel. Yeah, I mean, from the day one, it was very clear. There's an elephant in the room. And I think it came out very clear whether it's G19 plus one or G6 plus one. We are talking United States and President Donald Trump. I'll just push the boundaries to what our young leader had said. Let's try to be a little creative. Let's imagine President Trump says there are three specific issues he would unconditionally support or implement on G20. What would be those three things that this panel would ask his support from? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if someone in the panel wants to uh, digest and answer that, and we'll get the microphone over to the side of the room as well, please. And that is why, uh, Lars Henrik, the microphone is in a box, <laughs> so we can throw it like that. How uh, nice. Somebody, somebody speak. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Naoko, Naoko Ishii. I'm the CEO of the GF, Global Environment Facility. Um, today I have had a lot of great things at the uh, efficiency versus voice, or the women, or the gender, or the health, or uh, human well-being. But one thing I haven't really had much is actually environmental sustainability, which is the foundation of the entire SDG. And I'm just wondering, uh, for instance, Rick Summons mentioned about complacency in the human being that have a growth pattern. And I'm just wondering, this G20 is a kind of ignoring that uh, this environmental sustainability as a very important uh, the foundation for the future. It's just a kind of ignorance of that. By the way, I'm not a green person. I have been working for the Ministry of Finance for 30 years. I'm more like a combated <laughs> economist, combated maybe the environmentalist, but I just am so curious that uh, are we missing something very, very important thing for the future? Okay, thank you very much. We heard uh, a wide range of uh, views and uh, uh, perspectives there. Uh, Dennis Noor, could I ask you to perhaps um, draw some of those together. Uh, at the heart of this is the effectiveness of bodies like the G20 and the, the limits of their competence and the balance that they strike in terms of the, whether it's social issues, economic issues, or issues around uh, empowerment or climate change. I think the G20 has an extremely important role because its mandate is flexible. Yep. It has lots of opportunities for face-to-face -face contact between leaders. It has lots of expert groups. And this combination allows it to do what it should be doing, which is to focus on major human needs. And therefore, it is not surprising that its agenda has changed. Uh, and the agenda now um, focuses to some degree on the things that are troubling people. Now, with regard to three issues that uh, President uh, Trump may find uh, important, one we already know, uh, and that is the fight against protectionism. That is something that has been agreed uh, at uh, the G7. Second, um, is the need for empowerment. Lots of uh, his voters, lots of Americans feel that they have become disempowered, partly through globalization, partly through technological change. And the need for training and labor market integration is something that uh, he has acknowledged and one can build on. Thank you very much. I'm going to get one final sentence uh, from, uh, or three, uh, contributors from Rohinta Madura, from uh, Shanguan, and uh, uh, also from Carlos uh, Lopez. If I get a Carlos, I'll start with you. Well, maybe just uh, to know one, one question about climate change and the fact that you know Africa would like to, to enter the discussion about climate change as part of the solution and not just as a recipient of some capacity development activities, as good as they may be. But, you know, in fact, uh, Africa has the potential to be the leader on greening industrialization using a very short window of opportunity when other countries have to retrofit. Africa actually is building its industrial capacity in many areas. It can do it the right way with a low carbon footprint. And I think this is kind of discussions that we have to engage. Thank you so much. Uh, Zhang Guan, just a sentence or two, please, uh, in a summary. A sentence okay. or two. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll try to brief. 
uh, there is always a trade-off between diversity and uh, you know focus or concentration when we think about uh, the, the themes or topics of uh, a, a agenda or, or internet organizations so like uh, uh, like United Nations. Uh, as, uh, as far as G20 uh, is concerned, I think the priorities is very important. No priorities, no strategy, and uh, no solutions. Thank you very much. <coughs> and <coughs> Rahunta Madora, a concluding sentence or two from you. With a few s semicolons and commas. Um, <laughs> I'd say three things. Financial stability and financial issues are in the G20's DNAs. Uh, DNA, please get something right there. And with due respect to progress, the Panama Papers showed that something that the G20 says has been successful, tax havens have not been. Show a successful way that we can believe in it. Climate change for obvious reasons. And I've, uh, my third is new technology. And I thought what Michael Chertoff said yesterday was a good thought. Could we ring feds? financial sectors from uh, internet attacks and have a Geneva-type convention around that to show that we're managing new technologies for short-term needs. Thank you very much. I thank all of our uh, panelists. We have some uh, concluding thoughts now from, if you, if you can be brief, yes, please. If it's one sentence, let your voices be heard. I think that's a very important message. If you read one more sentence, the initial paragraph, I think it is of the Taomina communique, there's a sentence in there, something like that. We believe in the rules-based international order. <laughs> Everybody signed that, yeah. all seven. Uh, I think there's a difference between saying that and actually doing it. So I think accountability, let your voices be heard on those issues is very important, and you help us a lot when you do that. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that. Uh, Dennis Snower, Dirk Messner, your concluding thoughts to bring this panel discussion to an end. I think we still have lots of progress to make to align economies with social prosperity, and I think our discussion here has been very useful in that regard. Thank you so much. And Dirk Messner. Only one thought. We, the old economics have been about optimization of allocation of resources. I would like to make the value point strong. I mean, Africa on the table or not on the table, common goods and who have access to common goods, people-centered development. This is all about value decisions. And therefore, the G20 uh, process is being based on creating no new global values, which we base our decisions on. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking all of our contributors. Let's give them a round of applause. Nicely done, thank you.